Welcome to the second episode of Data Skeptic Animal Intelligence. Today on the show, we're featuring the Open Worm Project. Open Worm is an open source project dedicated to creating a virtual C. elegans nematode in a computer. C. elegans is a model species, which means it's very well studied. It's simple, at least compared to the complexity of a human body. Actually simple enough that they really have a deep way of modeling this thing. Although we won't really touch the philosophy of it, it does make you think. If we can fully simulate this thing, what does that say about the simulation? That's for you to ponder. We'll get into the practical questions on the show today. My name is Stephen Larson. I am affiliated with the Open Worm Foundation. I'm also affiliated with a for-profit software company in the life sciences called Metacell. Well, we're obviously going to talk mostly about Open Worm, but do you want to say a few things about Metacell before we get into it? Metacell is a company focused on making software applications for the life sciences to improve the experience that scientists have working with complex data. And then Open Worm, for listeners who haven't heard of it before, can you tell us a little bit about the project? Open Worm is a project started about 13 years ago with a mission of building the world's first simulated organism, the first digital organism. It takes a cellular biology approach and focuses on an animal that we know per cell the most about. It's been a endeavor that probably has no finish, no, no final conclusion, only iterations, and it continues to be of interest to the scientific community. And what particular organism is that? It is the organism uh, that has a funny you know, Latin name, Canoribidus elegans, C. elegans for short. And it is a worm that is microscopic. It is as long as a hair on your head is wide. And it is what's also known in biology as a model organism, which means a lot of research has been done on it. There's been uh, at least three Nobel Prizes given out for work done on the C. elegans for basic molecular mechanisms and cellular mechanisms of, of understanding how things work. So generally, it's like a organism from which we learn the basics of life, and then we use those clues in more complex organisms, uh, all the way up to humans, to see those same functions operating in all of life. So I know life is pretty diverse. You probably had a couple of choices. Uh, why C. elegans? There's all these firsts in C. elegans. So it's one of the first animals to have its full genome sequenced. It's the first animal to have its connectome mapped out at a level of every synapse uh, using an electron microscope. It's been one of the first animals to have green fluorescent protein tested in it, which has been extremely useful for marking different uh, cellular mechanisms and proteins uh, in cells. There are a lot of aspects to it. It was chosen back in the 50s by a gentleman named Sidney Brenner, as a really ideal organism for molecular biology. It has a lot of uh, useful properties. It grows very quickly in the lab. It has a property called utile, which is a really funny word, but it refers to the fact that it has a very stereotyped pattern of cellular divisions from an initial egg. So we've actually mapped out every division of every cell from uh, one cell to full uh, adult, which is also really exciting. So we understand a lot about its development. And this gives us this unparalleled ability to do genetic experiments with it. So it's this extremely useful test bed. And the community since, um, you know, uh, the 50s with Sidney Brenner has really taken advantage of these properties to just generate the most comprehensive data sets about, you know, its properties. Like I said, it's genome, it's connectome, but also things like RNAs that tend to be in cells and just all these properties. So anything that you hear about in cellular biology, it's probably been done and it's been done probably pretty comprehensively in C. elegans. But there's all these things that converge to make it like you want to do a thing in C. elegans and there's just a wealth of knowledge already present compared to any other organism where it generally costs more to collect these same data sets. And then you're describing it as a digital organism. I've uh, talked to some people who study traffic and they simulate traffic by kind of having you know, some representation of a car, but it's a little, I don't want to say wishy-washy, but like high level, right? You're kind of making some broad assumptions. Could you maybe go into the details about what it is to create a truly digital organism? It's probably never fully finished. One of the things to simulate life is you think about all these different processes that are happening at different scales of investigation. So we think about like multi-scale simulations. 
we wanted to pick at the beginning, at the outset, like a foundational scale to start with, which we could then do more simulating down into you know smaller scales as well as you know more simulating up. And so we sort of picked this like meso scale of cellular activity at the level of neurons and sort of slightly more granular than individual cells for movement. But we wanted to have as much as possible the ability to track back to individual cells. To be able to ground yourself in specific cells is very useful. This is one of the things about C. elegans I didn't mention yet, but every cell in its body, it has 956 cells total. 302 of them, give or take, is a, a neuron, and they have individual names. So that's something you don't really get as much in many other organisms. We wanted to be able to leverage that knowledge about individual cells, because as I said before, we know how every cell comes about all the way from the individual, from, from the original egg. I mean, all the cell divisions that lead up to like that muscle cell came from like this division of this division of this division of this, right? We figure that like having the identity of individual cells and then putting cells in the model and then having those cells do things is a, is a very powerful way to then ground out if you want to go you know, down or up. So we have uh, neurons, we have muscle cells uh, in particular. And of course, then the muscle cells are pulling the body around to make a crawling behavior. We also then went up to the level of behavior. So we have a model of the worm that actually flexes and bends, and it lives in its own, what we kind of lovingly call a worm matrix. So a simulated world that this body then bumps up against liquids and gels, which is the common environment that we find saligans in in a lab, which is on a Petri dish, a sort of like a, a gel-like material. So then what we can do is we can compare the behavior of the model as it sort of crawls around in this worm matrix to what real animals, real worms do when they're crawling around on dishes. But then we can go back down to the level of individual muscles, how individual muscles are triggered by neurons, which we also know their specific names and we know their specific connections to those muscles because that's been mapped out. And from there, we go sort of one level deeper which is to understand the ion channels that are inside each of the cells that give rise to chemical and electrical activity that uh, makes neurons fire. And once you get down to that level of ion channels uh, in your model, you're sort of at a quasi-protein level. From there, you know, we've always imagined and we you know, want in the future to be able to do things like have the, the precise count of how many of these ion channels are existing inside individual cells. To think about the trafficking of those ion channels from the nucleus, when they get generated, when they get pulled out, that sort of thing. And from there, you know, continue on to model the whole nucleus, all the gene networks that you find in individual cells and RNAs. So that's why the cellular scale is so valuable, because it, it is this uh, crossroads, if you will, between behavior and genetics. We came at this project like software engineers. So we had lots of software engineers on the project to begin with. And software engineers like to think about frameworks that you can build on in the future that are foundational. We didn't just build one model. We sort of laid out a framework that could have additional details hung on it, like you might hang ornaments on a Christmas tree. It's a simulation, but it's also a framework. Well, I definitely want to get at some point to discussing how you can extend and build on top of that framework. But for the moment, let's stay with the framework. If I were someone looking to use it, what, and I open the toolbox, what's inside for me to use? One of our strongest principles in the project was open source from the beginning. I'm proud that we've created a, between 40 and 60 repositories on GitHub. So right now you can go to github.com slash openworm and you can see all these repositories that have been made public. Because we organize it as a distributed open science project, one of the challenges is that there's a lot of chaos. So we endeavored to make some sense of it. We have a doc site at docs.openworm.org, which is a little out of date at this point, but it does capture a lot of the different repositories that are there. To simplify all of this, we made a home base repo at github.com slash openworm slash openworm. So like two openworms. And there we built a Docker container, which for those who aren't you know, up on the, on the parlance there, it's, it's basically a virtual computer that when you load it up, it comes preloaded with the core code of the simulation, which essentially includes the three-dimensional visualization, the worm matrix that I talked about, plus the simulator that simulates the activity of the muscle cells and the neurons. When it comes up, it loads the first sort of five seconds of the simulation because it does cost some computational power to run it. 
So the default is that it, it does a little bit of simulating, but then it will generate for you a little movie of the worm crawling around. This then allows you to kind of have your quick start. That's really important for open science uh, and open source projects to give you like a basic experience of runtime, the simulation, pointing you at like which are the code repositories to start with. And from there, you know, additional investigation uh, can happen. One of the challenges of the project is that it's quite technical. So, you know, onboarding new community members is a process and you kind of have to be pretty determined, I think, to learn some of the specifics of the libraries and, and to be able to map enough of that into your biological knowledge. But as I said, we try to put a lot of information up on docs.openworld.org help people do that. We have some tutorials to walk people through to understand some of the basics of the mathematical modeling frameworks that are underlying the simulation. But it's all out there. Uh, there's essentially nothing that uh, is, is held back. It's all, all publicly available on the internet. Well, I've watched some of those simulation videos, and we'll put some in the show notes for listeners to check out. To my eyes, it looks like a real worm, like an organic creature moving around that, that sort of um, emerged out of this, uh, what you're describing as like the going up process. You're starting from, you know, first principles and somehow through that simulation, you get lifelike behavior. But I also have an outsider's eyes. Would someone who looks at a microscope at re real C. elegans be able to notice a difference or is it virtually identical at this point? So a big part of the project actually has been validation. We have worked together with scientists that build, how shall I say, like behavior trackers for worms. So basically imagine that you've got a dish and you've got a camera that's pointed at it. And then using computer vision technology, you're actually doing worm tracking on that dish to see what real worms actually do and the way that they move and the kind of behaviors that they have. And that has been an important training set, if you will, for us. So We've built the simulation such that we can extract the same kind of wireframes from the simulation that you can get in the, in the real worm. So there are these sets of statistics that you can gather from doing these experiments where you're measuring real worms, like how fast do they crawl? How much do they bend when they crawl? This sort of stuff. And we've used some of those high level parameters to fix some of the things in the uh, physical body so that we know like that it's not bending outside of the parameters of what real worms bend and that it doesn't crawl any faster than real worms can crawl and this sort of stuff. But there's still a lot more to do there. So I, I definitely wouldn't claim that we've reached a level that it's indistinguishable from, from reality. In fact, it's more like it's a, a vessel. There's uh, additional details to capture. There's additional sort of sub behaviors to put into it. But we did focus on this basic thing of like crawling forward. Uh, we figured that crawling forward was our, you know, our first step, our like, you know, moon mission, if you will. Like get, get one thing is to make it crawl forward. And so we're pretty pleased about that. But, you know, worms do a whole lot of other things. You know, worms, as weird as it is to think about, they're whole animals that uh, have to survive in a dangerous environment. They have to find food. They have to, they have predators that are trying to eat them that they have to avoid. And then they have to find mates. There's a ton of behaviors that are layered on top of just a simple crawling forward that are not yet in the model, but are the ambition of uh, what we'd like to, to have in there as it evolves. I think you'd mentioned it started from sort of a software perspective, which I totally get. I have a similar background, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the biology community is ready to accept you. Can you talk about the process of getting people to acknowledge the project and start to bring it into their own work? We've actually had biologists collaborating with us from the beginning. And my own personal background, I actually, after getting a software engineering degree, I went in and got a neurobiology PhD. So I approached the project very much as I approached my own graduate work, which was to earn the credibility of biologists by speaking their language. And biologists speak the language of molecular biology and cellular biology. And I came into biology with a bit of chutzpah, thinking that uh, all that was needed here was good software engineering, and we'd kind of be able to make these simulations no problem and discovered that the challenge that biologists face, it's actually hard to investigate living systems in the way that we like to think as engineers, we're able to investigate engineered systems. The difference being that a human built all the engineered systems that we're familiar with, so they're a lot easier to debug. But nature is responsible for building you know, living systems. And so biologists are impoverished in their tools of investigation relative to what engineers can do. Generally, biologists want to change one variable at a time and see what happens. 
and they want to not make big statements about every other thing that might be happening inside of a living system because it's very complex. It's very nonlinear. Things that as engineers, we hate nonlinearities, but that's the way that the living systems work. So your question is like how to gain credibility amongst, amongst biologists. I think it's appreciating. You don't just build a simulation and you solve all the problems. You build a simulation and you describe some data and then you hope to describe a, more data and then you hope to describe more data. But you need to stay close to the data that you actually have that are measurable and generally not make big, bold, sweeping claims. So what we found with the project, which is interesting because it, it the project also has a goal of getting the public interested and, you know, being accessible and bringing a nexus between software and biology. So I'm quite pleased that over the course of the project, we published papers uh, alongside uh, academic biologists that have co-authored with us. We've released one special issue of a, a biological journal that focused on the crossovers between what we've done in the simulation space and data. In general, I'd say that the community has looked at this work as, you know, favorable and uh, is continuing to build upon it. Well, when it comes to human beings, often I'm sure you're familiar with the expression, we say there's nature and there's nurture. So to hear that you've mapped out all the cell divisions, you know all the neurons that even most of them are named, seems like the, the nature part is maybe pretty captured. Is there a nurture element you need to simulate as well? <laughs> Certainly. So every individual organism grows up and as soon as it starts growing it has its own individual unique i'd say experience in the world and you know in humans we think about it in terms of learning and in mammalian systems we think of learning based on a cert a very special thing that happens at the synapse of neurons which is then immediately giving the experience that that animal has, you know, a biological foundation that like actual molecules are changing their position inside of the, the animal. So nurture is, is a thing. And it's, it also provides, I think, kind of a limit on what you can ever even hope to simulate. Because if you're looking at one particular worm and you're saying, I want to simulate every single, you know, atom, every movement of every atom in that particular worm, it's like, well, you know, that worm had a very specific history. It encountered different things. You know, in the lab, you can create situations where a worm is exposed to different kinds of diets or different kinds of, you know, chemical environments and this sort of thing. And each one of those experiences will have an impact on its cells. Once we got really, you know, further and further into the project, again, we realized that how much complexity is present, even in something that's as small as a C. elegans, even as something that has as few cells as a C. elegans, it, it then opens the door for how complex every single individual cell actually is and what it means to think about, you know, the basic things you learn in biology class about transcription and translation, you know, the process of making proteins inside of a cell. Like that whole process, if you try to count every single protein and think about the life cycle of every single protein inside every single cell, I mean, now we're back up to the hundreds of thousands and millions of things that you need to be tracking, you know, in a simulation. It puts a boundary on what it means to really fully simulate an animal the way you'd think about, like simulating a plane or machinery of any kind, really, where you kind of ground out at, all right, there's, you know, an individual part and it's a button and I know how a button works and I don't need to go down and simulate the plastic molecules inside the button beyond a certain level. Well, I think we really haven't fully found the floor of simulating that we need to ground out at. We're only ever, I think, going to get to iterative improvement. I don't think uh, perfection is fully attainable, at least with the technology we have right now in this in this era. <laughs> yeah. Are there challenges there? Are you uh, hoping for you know faster machines ten years from now that'll uh, open up new opportunities? It's a model organism, so it's simple. But uh, I guess what are the computational challenges that exist? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a model organism, so it's simpler. I think Good is point. the first thing. Yeah. But but again, as I pointed out, you know, once we stripped away all the things that are complicated about simulating organisms that are larger, a lot of people think at the outset that if you had more compute, you'd do better at it. And there is a computational, one computational bottleneck in openworm in particular, which has to do with the fluid simulation that we use to simulate the body. So we could certainly improve the algorithm there and have bigger machines that more quickly run through that, and that would be helpful. But that's not, I think, the fundamental limitation. I think the fundamental limitation is still in 
getting the kind of data that we really want and need for making the model better and doing less guessing at what some of the parameters in the model should be. As I've sort of painted this picture that you can kind of look at the worm as like a worm that crawls, or you can look at it as this collection of cells, or you can look at it as all of the proteins that are inside the cells, right? And every time you go down, there's like more things that you want to track. Well, that bottom level of proteins, you can't really measure the position of every protein in the worm all at once. Like you just can't do it experimentally. Like maybe you could with some future technology that we don't have right now, but that's really what you would want at the end of the day to make the highest resolution simulation is like every microsecond, you know, what is every single protein in the body of this organism doing and how is that changing over an hour? We don't have that. That would be like the ultimate microscope. So what we have are things that are approximations of that. We have what some of the cells are doing some of the time at some resolution. And then you make another experiment and you have what other cells are doing. So right now, what's exciting is that this year at the International C. elegans meeting that happened in Glasgow, Scotland, that I attended uh, in June, more and more labs now are able to get data sets that combine the activity of the worm's brain with its movement in a single animal on one prep and have that as a combined data set. And that may sound like a thing that we should have had a long time ago because it's a model organism and it's simple, quote unquote, but actually it's required a lot of technological advancement. It requires having multiple microscopes pointed at the same worm, tracking worms moving around, and then it's involved a ton of molecular biology work to be able to isolate individual neurons inside of that specific worm, paint them with different colors so that you know which neuron you're looking at, and then have markers which change their intensity based on the activity of individual neurons. Um, So it's taken until now for us to begin to have those kinds of data sets. And I think that's only going to get better in the future as molecular biology gives us more tools. But ultimately, like I said, we're still a ways off from having this like protein you know, microsecond to microsecond level of data. And so that becomes the fundamental barrier to us making the model a lot better immediately. And could you highlight some of the fields that take an interest in the project? Like it seems to me a neuroscientist would be uh, interested in what's going on and probably a lot of other communities. Who's taken some of the most interest? Well, yeah, we, I mean, we've been a bit biased because we started off from a neuroscience perspective and uh, that was partially me, but also, you know, the people that we got on board, you know, in the early days. I think that's been correct, though, because in order to get to basics of behavior, you need to have a nervous system and you need to have, you know, the muscle system of it crawling around because that's fundamentally how we observe them. But there is a lot of other research that goes on in C. elegans, which is on display at meetings like the one that happened earlier this year. So there is things that would surprise most people. (laughs) There is like obesity research that happens in worms. And you're like, do worms get fat? And it's like, well, actually, we do study how adipose cells, which are not so different from what we have in our own bodies, which is the, the kind of cells that kind of collect fat, the molecular mechanism for fat accumulating inside of a cell is quite similar to what happens inside uh, a cell or a couple cells within the worm. So at the molecular level, what's happening in those particular little like quasi adipose cells is important. So we've envisioned again, that open worm down the road could take more of an interest in that kind of research. There's alcohol dependency and nicotine dependency uh, research that happens inside of worms, which is also kind of neuroscience adjacent. But again, similar molecular mechanisms. There's aging research that happens inside of C. elegans because the mechanisms of what happens when cells break down over time during aging, it's very accessible for us to uh, study within C. elegans. I wouldn't say right now that those communities are, are as interested in open worm because we haven't really incorporated those things into the model yet. I would think that down the road, that is the goal, that we get more and more of these sub-communities within the C. elegans world interested because there's actively a place to layer in those data and to see how they uh, work together with all the other data that we have about the worm. That really, at the end of the day, was the idea um, is to help this biological community have a crossroads so that you could see how one observation happening in a lab in one part of the world intersects with an observation happening in another part of the world in something other than just reading uh, a manuscript in a journal article, to actually put it into place like you'd put a puzzle piece into place in a jigsaw puzzle and then get to take a step back and say, okay, well, but if that's how the fat cell is growing, then 
what does that mean about how it's going to be crawling? And isn't it a little heavier now? And what's its brain going to have to do to compensate for the fact that it got a little fatter? And then like, yeah, I don't know. But now we have to like go find that answer, right? Because we have a model where these things are put into combination with one another. Speaking of other fields that could take an interest, do you think there are learnings from Open Worm that the artificial intelligence community should be paying attention to? I think there's been a profitable exchange from AI and you know neuroscience and biology happening throughout both of their histories, right? So neural networks, and ultimately uh, were inspired by neurons from the beginning. And I think there's also things to you know take from AI and bring into the project in terms of how much we can learn just by having very large data sets. I think what tends to challenge you know researchers in this field is that the AI that we have today really benefits from having big data, right? We, we went through an era where everybody with big data was the big buzzword. And now we have AI. Well, these things are related. We were able to build things like large language models because we had very, very, very large data sets. And with biology, what people tend to not think about as much is that because the data sets are so expensive to gather, you don't tend to have hundreds of thousands of examples of the data that you're that you're looking at. Like today, I think the best that we have is because we have so many gene sequences, there's a lot you can do in the area of genetics with AI models. But in C. elegans, you typically have a handful of labs and therefore kind of like a handful of human beings that are painstakingly grinding out these data. They're not doing it in a high throughput way. And so there's individual differences between how lab A and lab B and lab C collect these data. So whenever AI scientists come to me and they have in the past, and they're like, great, show me all the data. We'll, we'll solve this model. No problem. That's the biggest thing that surprises uh, AI scientists about this project is that there is not a large volume of data to actually train on. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of work to do on Open Worm alone, but uh, not to say that you want to go start a new project, but maybe a new project could be inspired by Open Worm. Uh, What would uh, be next? Are there other organisms you'd like to see modeled? The idea has always been to have kind of a beachhead, if you will, to use a military term, right? And to use the worm as a foundation You know, biology has lots of other model organisms that have similar communities around them. There's a zebra fish. There's the drosophila, which is a fruit fly, basically, like just the same as a fruit fly that you might have as a pest in your home. Those two animals are also uh, very highly studied. Of course, there's uh, mice, as you get up into, you know, rodents that are used to understand uh, mechanisms that are more human-like. So all of those, you know, animals, I think, are important for us to be collecting you know, data on. But I think that the challenge ends up being, and and you see this a lot, you see, you know, exciting new maps being made in all of these animals on a regular basis. I think what then the limitation ends up being is that you still kind of come back to how to hook all of these data together into models where the data are uh, turned into interacting components. And that's where I think OpenWorm is going to continue to be necessary because we're not finished, you know, with uh, the model. The framework there still has gaps. And I think our perspective has been that you kind of have to fill those gaps in with something simpler before you can fully do it in the ones that are more complicated, because you're, you're, it's going to be even harder to do it when you're flooded with either data that's more granular, because that's as much as you collect, or just more plentiful, because it's a larger, it's a larger animal. Yes, I think modeling other organisms is good, but I think that you know, science is going to have to move through the stages that's going to start with something as simple as, you know, cell. And so we don't even have a fully modeled yeast cell at the level of cellular biology, which makes C. elegans even look like chutzpah compared to that, because you're like, how are you going to account for the gaps that that are absent in yeast cells, guys? And then bacteria below that still have gaps too. So it's a whole process, I think, of modeling life. And we don't claim to have in any shape or form finished But what I am proud of is that we have put forward what I think has been a really strong start to this process of using simulations ultimately to better figure out how life works and and hopefully accelerate our ability to, you know, find cures to intractable diseases. Well, I know this next question drifts a bit into philosophy, and uh, we might even lack the vocabulary to talk really about free will and determinism and consciousness and stuff like that. But through this process, do you have any thoughts on C. elegans? Is it just an automaton, or is there some life that's being simulated? We're going to continue to evolve our understanding of what those ideas mean, I think, as we go to the future. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think 
ChatGPT by itself has made me philosophical about free will and intelligence and are we automatons. And that's just in a year. I think a lot of folks who have railed against the idea that a computer could quote unquote understand something, you know, are now starting to say like, yeah, I think ChatGPT understood my question. And then like, but wait, how can it? I thought only, you know, humans can understand things. And what does that mean about free will? So I personally think we're going through an era of philosophical free for all on, on some of these questions. There is a lens in which you can look at living animals through where they are unique individuals that have a path all of their own, that they seem to act like they have free will. But I think there is another lens that you can look at animals uh, through, uh, and this applies to the elegans and, and humans, where, yeah, they are just grinding out a set of rules that are based on, you know, successive levels of understanding from physics all the way up to, you know, behavioral science. They appear to, to us to have free will and make their own choices, but really they're just operating in such a high parameter space, to use kind of a sciencey you know, word, but in a, such a high parameter space that, you know, you can't tell that they are kind of automatons. I mean, this is the thing that I take away from ChatGPT is that it's, it's some you know, 70 billion parameters of a model, or maybe more, maybe 1.2 trillion, I suppose we haven't fully heard how many parameters it is. And that's like mind boggling to think about, you know, how many parameters in a model, but then what comes out is what seems to be intelligence that, you know, I had professors at MIT grinding out a whole career trying to achieve. I think it's really interesting times for those sorts of philosophical questions, because, you know, one thing is to, you know, do the armchair philosopher thing. And then the other is to build a thing and put it in the world and say like, well, you could disagree that it understands, but here's, it's performing at the level of, you know, intelligence. So you go figure out what you want to say about philosophically, what is it, does it have free will or not? You know? And could you talk to the opportunities for someone to make contributions to Open Worm? Maybe what's the right background and what are some of the things they could work on? Go to openworm.org, click the volunteer link there, get started. You'll fill out a contributor form. You'll get dropped into a Slack uh, workspace. And then that's the starting point for the community. And through that entry point, you know, over the last bunch of years, we've um, sponsored students through Google of Code uh, programs, which also thank you, Google, for having a Google of Code program, which is something that Google has facilitated for more than a decade now to get engineering students to contribute to open source projects. And that's one channel if folks want to have like an internship. But beyond that, you know, that's also the entry point to just being able to ask questions in a Slack forum of other people that are around and kind of get started. I'm always available. You know, my email address is Stephen with a PH at openworm. Dot org if folks want to ask questions, and we can get you pointed into various stuff. Open science is similar to open source, which is the materials are out there, and just kind of like get in there and pick up a shovel and start digging, and then see who notices. Um, you can file an issue on, on any of the repos. Um, but yeah, always excited to see where the project kind of goes. It, 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 to some extent, has a life of its own at this point. And what's the future of the project? What's got you most excited about it going forward? I would say that these data sets that are being generated that I mentioned earlier that combine brain activity with uh, behavior is essentially something the project had, has been waiting for for years. We anticipated that these kinds of data sets would be available when we started, and we just kind of collected as much data as we could in all the other domains waiting for it. Now that it's here, I'm really excited to bring that data to bear into the, the current level of simulations and to have our worm matching these data sets and figuring out what it means to match uh, together with these data sets. I think that's some of the stuff that we're the most excited about going forward. Plus, just the, resume, the resuming of C. elegans meetings, which went to sleep during COVID, is, is always an excellent uh, opportunity to bring these communities together of engineering science and, and biological science. So a lot of great, you know, PhD students and postdocs that are coming out of those labs, you know, continue to contribute into the Open Worm Project and to get valuable insights from it. I look forward to that continuing uh, as we go. And where's the best place for listeners to follow you and follow the project online? openworm.org. Yeah, connect with our socials uh, sure. on there. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and share the project. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for your interest, and yeah, good luck uh, with the podcast going forward. 